Hey everybody, so recently Sargon of Akkad made a video responding to a piece of mine called Anita Sarkeesian and the People Who Hate Her. What he came up with was an interesting response, and it's the topic of today's video. Now, I don't want to belabor this intro too much, so let me just tell you the two questions I hope to answer over the course of this video. The first question I'll answer, the thing that everybody's probably the most interested in, does Sargon of Akkad destroy my ass with facts and logic? The second question I'll answer, the thing I'm more interested in, what does this video say? Like, as a work of art, what can it tell us about Sargon of Akkad or anything else? So that's this video, and I hope you enjoy. I'd recommend watching Sargon's video and my own before checking this out, but that's like 80 minutes of your time, so I'll try to make this as accessible as possible. And with that out of the way, let's jump in. Part 1. Where is Sargon coming from? Okay, let's just start with one of Sargon's bigger points. So in his video, Sargon looks at what Anita Sarkeesian says about the game Double Dragon, and he sees that her read of the game, as something where men have and exert power, and where the one female character is an object through which power is expressed, is fair enough. It's not some foreign thing that she's picking up out of nowhere. Sure, you can say that the woman is not an actor in the story. She is the subject of the, the object of the story. And it is the men who are the actors, the subjects who are working their way, fighting their way through, you know, hordes of enemies in order to save her. What Sargon disagrees with, however, is how these things should be framed. Where Anita looks at the game in terms of patriarchy, Sargon cites the normal person, who reads the game as a simple story about love and heroism. And while he thinks both interpretations are reasonable-ish, he thinks the latter one is much better, mostly because it's reflective of the history of storytelling. One way is interpreting it maliciously, and the other way is interpreting it... I guess charitably, but the charitable interpretation is obviously how the designers of the game intended it. Because, I mean, it just fits into all of the heroic narratives that men have told one another since the dawn of time. As Sargon says later on, there is no objective interpretation to art, and so there's no reason why we should favor Anita's interpretation over any other. There is no universal meaning to art. That's the problem, in fact, with critiquing art, isn't it? Now, what is Carl doing with this argument? Well, he's trying to prove his point by introducing a false dichotomy. See, when Anita Sarkeesian read Double Dragon the way she did, she never made the claim that that was the only interpretation that could ever be applied to the text. And luckily for us, Carl and Anita's interpretations do not contradict each other in any way. Like, sure, if you play Double Dragon, it's obviously true that the game is about heroism and romantic love. That, as Carl points out, it harkens back to ancient modes of storytelling. But, you might notice, this fact does nothing but strengthen Anita Sarkeesian's claim here. Yes, Double Dragon does evoke things like chivalric romance. It's using a trope, the damsel in distress, that gets its name from these works of art. So what Anita Sarkeesian does is agree with this idea and then ask a question. What does this historic trope say about gender? What social vision does it come from? And the answer, something that Sargon agrees with, is that it comes from a culture that oppressed and subjugated women. To be honest with you, a lot of history is sexist. So. It's not like you can turn around and say that there's no validity to any of these claims. That treated them as precious objects that lacked most forms of power and rights and needed to be protected by the empowered class, men. So what Carl says isn't an argument against Sarkeesian's perspective. Rather, it's literally what she means when she says that Double Dragon contains regressive ideas. Most recently, Double Dragon Neon in 2012 reintroduced new gamers to this regressive crap yet again. The messages of the game regress to a historical moment where various harmful and artificial gender hierarchies were imposed by society. So cool. If these two arguments don't contradict each other, and if they both seem pretty valid, then what is Sargon doing when he presents them as two mutually exclusive choices that battle against each other? 
Well, he's telling us his preferences. In short, he would rather think of the game as a simple story of love and heroism, and he would rather not think of the game in terms of gendered oppression. And that's weird to me, because, okay, I think that's fine. Look, Sargon, I think this stuff is interesting and helpful, and I like to slurp it up. But I don't want to make you slurp it up. I couldn't do that even if I wanted to. And neither myself nor Anita Sarkeesian ever said something to the contrary of that. You can choose what media you like to consume, and you can choose how to consume it. Nobody's chasing after you with an Anita Sarkeesian hot take. But at the same time, this discussion of personal preference isn't related to the point I was making, is it? Whether or not you enjoy Anita's interpretation is a totally different question from whether or not that interpretation is reasonable or evidenced by the text. And you're responding to a video that talks about the latter question with points that only speak to the former. And that is the interesting trick that Sargon pulls here. Because it looks like he's talking about me. He plays a thing I said, and he responds to it, and all that stuff. But all he really does is present my and Sarkeesian's work in terms of his own ego. He doesn't disagree with the points in front of him because they lack merit. In fact, the entire concept of merit is posed as illusory and unimportant in this conversation. There is no universal meaning to art. That's the problem, in fact, with critiquing art, isn't it? Rather, he disagrees with them because he wills them to be untrue. In his mind, Anita Sarkeesian is trying to express her will over us, and he's trying to express his, and whoever wins that battle is correct about the game Double Dragon. The media itself, the number of meanings we can get from it, couldn't be less important. And as we watch Sargon's video, we can see that every moment of it surrounds this fixation on will and power, that it permeates the entire work. For instance, Carl says at one point that he's only interested in challenging Anita's most ludicrous claim, that video games cause literal increases to violence against women. I don't care about your value judgments about my opinion of the interpretation of data that shows that Anita Sarkeesian's assertions that video games are making us more violent towards men or women is just not true. But here's the thing, she never said that. He's transparently lying, and he repeats this lie a few times in the video. She was always the one saying that the effects of media are subtle and complex. That was enough for her. Likewise, engaging with these games is not going to magically transform players into raging sexists. We typically don't have a monkey see, monkey do direct cause and effect relationship with the media we consume. Cultural influence works in much more subtle and complicated ways. And he was the one who cared about murder rates. But it concludes that video games can increase aggressive cognition and aggressive behavior. But that does not, for some reason, translate into an increase in violent crime. So what's the problem? And when I pointed this out on Twitter, he just responded, then there is literally no reason to care about her analysis. And it's like, okay, then there is literally no reason why you should care about her work. That's fine. I mean, for me, that doesn't make any sense at all. I think there are plenty of reasons to care about behavior and society that go beyond violent acts. You might call me something of a utilitarian. I generally think that actions that increase pleasure and decrease harm are good, and I care about people doing them even when they're not busy murdering. But okay, he doesn't care about this stuff. I don't know why he lied, but his preferences are noted. And that's all he felt the need to express here. His preferences. The imposition of his identity and taste is the only argument he felt he needed to make. Or let's look at one more argument-based example. At one point during this section, Sargon says this. Nobody is saying that video games cannot be harmful. I mean, there are people who have died playing video games. 
because they were playing for too long. There is obviously the capacity for video game addiction, but the question is, are they in and of themselves the problem, or is it something regarding them? Can these things be enjoyed responsibly? And the answer is, of course they can. So, watching this, I thought it was kind of absurd. I mean, there are all sorts of questions about the impact of art that aren't chained to the idea that people can't consume it responsibly. And here's a spicy one. Does the media in question tend to cultivate certain behaviors and dispositions? Like, you watch an ad on TV for a delicious all-you-can-eat shrimp buffet, and you love shrimp, so you reasonably think to yourself, I want to go to that restaurant. I want to get those tasty shrimp inside of me. But then, as you're walking to the Chuck E. Cheese's, excited to have your fill, you open up your phone and see an article from the New York Times. Acclaimed shrimp buffet only serves the butt of the shrimp. They only serve the anus. You put your phone in your pocket and walk home, disgusted. Now, looking at this hypothetical, we can see that the shrimp ad had a clear effect on this guy's behavior. It literally made him want to go out and do a thing. And this effect doesn't become unimportant just because this guy is a rational actor who, upon seeing another piece of media, responsibly changed his mind. The ad worked. That's interesting on the face of it. And besides, not everybody's going to have access to this New York Times article. People are going to go to this Chuck E. Cheese's because of the ad under the false pretense that they're about to get the full shrimp body and not just the aim. And isn't that worthy of investigation too? Well, no. Sargon is the question police. He gets to decide which questions are and are not worthy of our time. And he has decreed that the only thing we should talk about is a thing with an obvious answer. Can these things be enjoyed responsibly? And the answer is, of course they can. Again, the parameters of this conversation, as well as the process through which we decide what is true and untrue, is dictated only by Carl's preference. His ego is the argument. And what's kinda interesting is that when we look at Sargon's video through this lens, we can see that various things he does that appear silly are in fact really essential to what's going on here. Like, why is he constantly pausing my video while I'm just recapping his arguments so that he can say, yes, and those are very good arguments. To the skeptics and anti-SJWs, she's seen in all ways as a force for bad. A dishonest critic, an opportunist, a scam artist, an ideologue, a huge dick. Yeah, but all of those things are actually demonstrable, so why wouldn't we say them? The entire premise of the series that she got feminists to give her $160,000 to explore would be bullshit. Thunderfoot makes a good point, doesn't he? <laughs> but so what? Well, so what? We all already know he thinks they're good arguments. That's why I'm portraying them accurately and making a response to them. Now, his job is to respond to that response, right? Not just unnecessarily repeat himself. Or why, in the first minutes of his video, does he go out of his way to say that I only like Anita Sarkeesian because I'm not well served by masculinity? Anita Sarkeesian seems to generally hate the concept of masculinity, and you don't look like you're very well served by the concept of masculinity. So I can believe that you think she makes good points. Isn't that a bit cringy and disingenuous to reduce the arguments of an objectively hot troubadour to how hot you think he is? Or, and here's my favorite, why does he pause my video when I say that science isn't capable of disproving that media affects people? I don't think that science is actually capable of disproving obvious facts about the way people work. Claim that whatever I'm about to say is some religious, feelings-based nonsense. It's your subjective interpretation that you are going to refer to here, not someone else's. There is nothing objective about what you're going to say because you've just dismissed science. Watch further and then pause and say, well, obviously media is the sort of thing that affects people, and that's not the sort of thing that science can disprove. Well, brilliant. Yes, 
Yes, there, there is an effect on my body and brain when I consume media. But that effect is not to make someone violent. After all, we have our sense data and memory and history to objectively prove that claim. So, which is it? Am I not the anti-scientific religious left that you want me to be? Or are we just advocates of the same religion? I don't know. When I first saw these things in Sargon's video, I thought they felt sort of desperate. Like, he knew he didn't have a lot of arguments against what I said, so he had to supplement his work with a bunch of guff that doesn't actually accomplish anything. But ultimately, these sorts of tactics that Sargon employs are in some incidental part of his video. Rather, they are simply doing the only thing he cares about doing. He needs to nag us over and over that he thinks his past positions are good, because his thinking they're good and saying it a lot makes him appear stronger. He needs you to know that I only like Sarkeesian because I'm a beta male, because he's only concerned with power, and so it's relevant that he thinks I don't have this form of power. He needs you to think that I'm some religious, irrational man, even if he has to contradict that 30 seconds later, because it's not me being that way that matters, it's just him saying it, you hearing it, that counts. These actions are all fundamentally the same as looking at the game Double Dragon, seeing two interpretations that are both perfectly reasonable and don't contradict each other, and telling us, you have to choose one or the other. And there is no objective way to make that decision, so you should choose the one that I care about. The will to be right is what makes him right. Part 2. Where is Sargon going? So, there's a word that's been coming up again and again in this video, that we've been sort of dancing around this whole time. The word is care, or to be more precise, the lack of care. And it's a word that Sargon seems to be obsessed with. We can see it in the opening moments of his video. Why are we still talking about Anita Sarkeesian? Nobody cares anymore. Honestly, I don't really know why we're doing this. Who cares about Anita Sarkeesian? Her channel is dead. And from there, it becomes a sort of mantra, repeated by Sargon over and over and over again. He doesn't care about my religion, he doesn't care about harm that doesn't take the form of violence, he doesn't care about Anita Sarkeesian. Yeah, but the thing is, I'm not religious, and I don't really care about her religion, and I don't care about her opinion on the things that I enjoy. If the answer is to get more women into video games, I don't give a fuck how many women are in video games. I just don't care. Let's assume that the, every every critique of Anita Sarkeesian's was completely true. Well, wh okay, why? Why, why, do, why do we care? So, no, I don't care about her opinion. It's just her saying, I don't like it. And I don't care if she doesn't like it. So, I find the constant repetition of this phrase, like, unreasonably interesting. It's honestly why I decided to make this video in the first place. Because, if taken on face value, his saying, I don't care, is almost ridiculous. For one thing, that claim doesn't really have any substance, does it? It's not evidence that anybody's incorrect, it just functions as an end to the conversation. The point after which nothing you could say, right or wrong, could possibly mean anything to the person you're talking to. But more than that, this statement would be almost incomprehensible in any similar context. Imagine Carl made a response to my Shark Tale video, and every 10 seconds he paused to say, Why are you talking about this 15-year-old movie? Who cares? Like, yeah, that is something that a lot of people wouldn't be interested in. But the contract we sign as we enter Shark Tale discourse is that it's the sort of thing we want to talk about. And if you don't want to sign that contract, you should probably leave the conversation to the people who do. Carl here is just the kid who wanted to play laser tag with his classmates, only to complain the entire afternoon that lasers are boring. Why did you come to my birthday party, dude? You don't like me, you don't like the thing we're doing, and you could have literally done anything else with your time. 
But what this sort of understanding fails to recognize is that Carl not caring and talking about not caring over and over isn't just really important to this video, it's also the logical and necessary conclusion of everything we've been talking about. When your entire way of seeing, the way you decide a good argument from a bad one, comes to you through the assertion of your power and will, any attention or care that you pay to the opposition represents a chink in your armor. To care about Anita Sarkeesian or any of this stuff would be to acknowledge that these things are worthy of concern. And if he did that, his argument could not revolve around his ego and preference anymore. He would have to sign the contract to engage with the subject matter, to give his input on the questions we've decided to invest our time in. And this, I think, is the real tragedy of Sargon of Akkad. Because, let me let you in on a little secret, a common observation that you've probably been thinking this whole time. Carl Benjamin does care about this. I mean, I'm not a mind reader, I don't know what's going on inside his head, but he sure does spend a lot of time listening to Sarkeesian and to me, and coming up with responses and disagreeing. Anita was the first subject Sargon ever made a video about. She was the first person who made him want to say something on the internet and be heard. He's made many videos about Gamergate. In one, he talks about how important this stuff is to him. The guy expresses a lot of care in his work. And what I kind of find sad about this is, like, isn't that a good or at least reasonable thing to do? I know I care about Anita Sarkeesian's videos and care about what Sargon says. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made my video in the first place. But also, why shouldn't we care? I understand that this stuff happened a few years ago, but is it so weird to devote some time to something that significantly changed our culture? That helped draw the parameters of our extremely polarized internet? I know it might sound silly, but I think that Anita Sarkeesian and her critics are a big part of our online history. But Sargon can't just be okay with caring about this. It's impossible for him. He wants to be a part of this conversation, to express his thoughts on the internet, but he's put himself in this paradoxical position where the only way to engage is by disengaging. I care about this subject and want to prove I'm right, but the only way I can do that is by showing that me caring, anybody caring, is dumb. I am here now only because I don't want to be. And this position really hits its peak toward the end of Sargon's video. So, in my video, I argue that we need to be able to criticize the messages of art, not based upon their impact on society, but based on the quality of the message alone. And to help me prove my points, I talk about a hypothetical Nazi propaganda film, Lubin Schlubin, that has no demonstrable impact on society, but which we must be able to criticize anyway, because it advocates Nazism. Uh, and I'll put everything I said about Lubin Schlubin on the screen right now, so that you can just read it if you didn't see the original video. Now, there's two main ways that Sargon tries to get around this point. The first thing he says is just really strange, and even though it's not, like, part of the thesis of this video, I figured it would be best to talk about it anyway. No, Carl says, Lubin Schlubin isn't dangerous, and there's no reason to reject it based upon its harmful message, since in this society, nobody's doing something bad because of it, since it doesn't convince people to become Nazis. Then Lubin Schlubin is not a dangerous work of art. It might do a really great job of showing Nazis exactly what they want to hear. In fact, it might just be exactly like a feminist frequency video critiquing video games. It might, in fact, be turning the entire world anti-feminist, but really pander and really stimulate feminist sensibilities. This supposedly acts as evidence for the later claim that any moral critique of art is ungrounded, a mirage. You may think that you can talk about the worth of art from a political or moral perspective, but in fact, 
that's just a mirage. Yes. But, see, this is the sort of logic that would make a robot's head explode. Because, yes, I fully agree that within this society, Lubin Schlubin is not dangerous. But it is only not dangerous now because people have already recognized that the movie contains bad ideas. To put this another way, Carl is arguing that there is no merit in condemning this film's ideology because people have already condemned it. But now we have to ask, how did people condemn it in the first place? Did they cite some social harm it was doing? Well, no, they couldn't have, because in the end, no harm was done by the movie. Rather, they just looked at the message of the film, and rightly concluded that it was a bad one. This here is the distinction between harmful ideas and harmful actions. Where harmful actions cause material damage to real people, harmful ideas can only cause damage if people want to pursue them. And it's good to advocate against harmful ideas specifically because we don't want them to materialize in the real world. That's like the best thing about freedom of speech, isn't it? That as a society, we can sort the harmful ideas from the helpful ones simply by talking to each other freely about it. But anyway, uh, that was all very complicated and long, and I could honestly write a whole video about the intricacies of it, but it's the second thing that Sargon says that I really care about. You're not giving it a storytelling critique or any other kind of critique that you could apply to a work of art. No, you're giving it a political critique, which is entirely dependent on your own political bias, which is, again, once we come back to, yes, People who like it are going to like it because they already happen to believe it, because it already plays into their biases. But anyone who doesn't already have that bias, who's looking for actual harm done by this Nazi propaganda film, might find nothing. In the same way that I don't believe the actual harm done by feminist frequency videos it amounts to anything either. In the, it's exactly the same process, with you and feminism as your hypothetical Nazis and Lubin Schlubin. And it's not bad because somebody might become a Nazi when they see it. No, it's bad because it advocates bad things. This is your value judgment. And honestly, if you can say this about your hypothetical film, then I can say this about Anita Sarkeesian's critiques. Wow, just listen to that. That is just your political bias speaking. And if you can say that about Nazi propaganda, why can't I say the same about feminist frequency videos? Carl, look what my video has done to you. See, I thought you cared about facts and evidence and reason. I thought you thought that patriarchy doesn't exist in modern Western culture, that feminism is stupid, and so it's silly to want media to reflect that ideology. At the end of the day, I really thought that's what you believed. But the minute somebody points out that we should be able to criticize media on its moral worth, the entire house of cards comes toppling down, doesn't it? No, he says, you are not able to ground your critiques in anything rational. And you know what? Neither can I. You hate Nazi ideology for some arbitrary reason. I hate feminist ideology for some arbitrary reason. And the only difference between your idea and mine is that mine is stronger. And the people who disagree are probably not well served by masculinity. And we can do what we want and we don't have to care what they say. And besides, aren't we both entitled to our political bias? Well, yes, Carl. If you want my permission, you can have it. Believe whatever you want. But the next time you want to make a political assertion, the next time you want to decry Patreon for hating free speech, the next time you want to say that Muslim people are dangerous, the next time you want to say that your video games are worthy of protection, that they are a moral good, I want everybody to remember this. Remember the way that you were willing to sacrifice yourself and your entire perspective to say that you think Anita Sarkeesian's videos are bad for no real reason at all. You were willing to do all that 
just so you could keep being King Baby, sitting on a big throne in a moral wasteland where nothing matters or even exists except for what you want. So, uh, that was all I had to say about this stuff. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that it's my first and last response video. Uh, if you liked it, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, and give money to my Patreon. And also be sure to come to my uh, charity stream. I'll be playing Getting Over It 50 times for the Christchurch shooting. That should be a somber occasion. Uh, anyway, now it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Uh, Emily Ilfelder asks, If you couldn't be making video essays, what would you do? Uh, well, I would want to do something with writing, you know? Uh, I, uh, growing up, I wanted to be a sketch comedian, uh, or a short story writer, or a screenwriter, or anything like that. But beyond that, you know, if I couldn't do anything involving writing, I have no idea. You know, I can't, I can't remember a time, uh, where I didn't want to be a writer. Anyway, <laughs> uh, that's the end. Bye. I love you. What?